Sister Madalena by Ralph Adams Cram. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gail Seymour. Sister Madalena by Ralph Adams Cram. Across the valley of the Oreto from Moriale, on the slopes of the mountains just above the little village of Parco, lies the old convent of Santa Catarina. From the cloister terrace at Moriale you can see its pale walls and the slim campanile of its chapel rising from the crowded citron and mulberry orchards that flourish, rank and wild, no longer cared for by pious and loving hands. From the rough road that climbs the mountains to Assunto, the convent is invisible, a gnarled and ragged olive grove intervening, and a spur of cliffs as well, while from Palermo one sees only the speck of white, flashing in the sun, indistinguishable from the many similar gleams of desert monastery or pauper village. Partly because of this seclusion, partly by reason of its extreme beauty, Partly, it may be, because the present owners are more than charming and gracious in their pressing hospitality, Santa Caterina seems to preserve an element of the poetic, almost magical. And as I drove with the Cavalieri Valguanera one evening in March out of Palermo, along the garden valley of the Areto, then up the mountain side, where the warm light of the spring sunset swept across from Moriale, lying golden and mellow on the luxuriant growth of figs and olives and orange trees and fantastic cacti, and so up to where the path of the convent swung off to the right round a dizzy point of cliff that reached out, gaunt and gray from the olives below. As I drove thus in the balmy air, and saw of a sudden a vision of creamy walls and orange roofs, draped in fantastic festoons of roses, with a single curving palm-tree stuck black and feathery against the gold sunset, it is hardly to be wondered that I should slip into a mood of visionary enjoyment, looking for a time on the whole thing as the misty phantasm of a summer dream. The Cavaliere had introduced himself to us, Tom Rendell and me, one morning soon after we reached Palermo, when, in the first bewilderment of architects in this paradise of art and color, we were working nobly at our sketches in that dream of delight, the Capella Palatina. He was himself an amateur archaeologist, he told us, and passionately devoted to his island, so he felt impelled to speak to any one whom he saw appreciating the almost and in a way fortunately unknown beauties of Palermo. In a little time we were fully acquainted, and talking like the oldest friends. Of course he knew acquaintances of Rendell's, someone always does. This time they were officers on the tubby USS Quinby, that, during the summer of 1888, was trying to uphold the maritime honor of the United States in European waters. Luckily for us, one of the officers was a kind of cousin of Rendell's, and came from Baltimore as well, so, as he had visited at the Cavalieri's place, we were soon invited to do the same. It was in this way that, with the luck that attends Rendell wherever he goes, we came to see something of domestic life in Italy, and that I found myself involved in another of those adventures for which I naturally sought so little. I wonder if there is any other place in Sicily so faultless as Santa Caterina. Taormina is a paradise, an epitome of all that is beautiful in Italy, Venice excepted. Giurgenti is a solemn epic, with its golden temples between the sea and hills. Cefalu is wild and strange, and Muriale a vision out of a fairy tale. But Santa Catarina! Fancy a convent of creamy stone and rose-red brick, perched on a ledge of rock midway between earth and heaven, the cliff falling almost sheer to the valley two hundred feet and more, the mountain rising behind straight towards the sky, all the rocks covered with cactus and dwarf fig trees, the convent draped in smoldering roses, and in front a terrace with a fountain in the midst, and then nothing between you and the sapphire sea six miles away. Below stretches the Eden Valley, the Concha de Oro, gold-green fig orchards alternating with smoke-blue olives, the mountains rising on either hand and sinking undulously away toward the bay, where, like a magic city of ivory and nacre, Palermo lies guarded by the twin mountains, Monte Pellegrino 
and Capo Zafferano. Arid rocks, like dull amethysts, rose in sunlight, violet in shadow, lions cochant, guarding the sleeping town. Seen as we saw it for the first time that hot evening in March, with the golden lambent light pouring down through the valley, making it in verity a shell of gold, sitting in Indian chairs on the terrace, with the perfume of roses and jasmines all around us, the valley of the Oreto, Palermo, Santa Catarina, Muriale, all were but parts of a dreamy vision, like the heavenly city of Sir Percival, to attain which he passed across the golden bridge that burned after him as he vanished in the intolerable light of the beatific vision. It was all so unreal, so phantasmal, that I was not surprised in the least when, late in the evening after the ladies had gone to their rooms, and the Cavaliere, Tom, and I were stretched out in chairs on the terrace, smoking lazily under the multitudinous stars, the Cavaliere said, "'There is something I really must tell you both before you go to bed, so that you may be spared any unnecessary alarm.' "'You are going to say that the place is haunted,' said Rendell, feeling vaguely on the floor beside him for his glass of Amaro. "'Thank you. It is all it needs.' The Cavaliere smiled a little. "'Yes, that is just it. Santa Caterina is really haunted.' and much as my reason revolts against the idea as superstitious and savouring of priestcraft, yet I must acknowledge I see no way of avoiding the admission. I do not presume to offer any explanations. I only state the fact. And the fact is that to-night one or the other of you will in all human or unhuman probability receive a visit from Sister Madalena. You need not be in the least afraid. The apparition is perfectly gentle and harmless, and, moreover, having seen it once, you will never see it again. No one sees the ghost, or whoever it is, but once, and that usually is the first night he spends in the house. I myself saw the thing eight, nine years ago, when I first bought the place from the Marchese de Muxaro. All of my people have seen it, nearly all of my guests, so I think you may as well be prepared. Then, "'Tell us what to expect,' I said. "'What kind of ghost is this nocturnal visitor?' "'It is simple enough. "'Sometime to-night you will suddenly awake "'and see before you a Carmelite nun, "'who will look fixedly at you, "'say distinctly and very sadly, "'I cannot sleep, and then vanish. "'That is all. "'It is hardly worth speaking of. "'Only some people are terribly frightened "'if they are visited unwarned by strange apparitions, "'so I tell you this that you may be prepared.' "'This was a Carmelite convent, then,' I said. "'Yes, it was suppressed after the unification of Italy, "'and given to the house of Muxaro. "'But the family died out, and I bought it. "'There is a story about the ghostly nun, "'who was only a novice, and even that unwillingly, "'which gives an interest to an otherwise very commonplace "'and uninteresting ghost. "'I beg that you will tell it us,' cried Rendell. "'There is a storm coming,' I added. See, the lightning is flashing already up among the mountains at the head of the valley. If the story is tragic, as it must be, now is just the time for it. You will tell it, will you not? The Cavaliere smiled that slow, cryptic smile of his that was so unfathomable. As you say, there is a shower coming, and as we have fierce tempests here, we might not sleep, so perhaps we may well sit up a little longer, and I will tell you the story. The air was utterly still, hot and oppressive. The rich, sick odor of the oranges just bursting into bloom came up from the valley in a gently rising tide. The sky, thick with stars, seemed mirrored in the rich foliage below, so numerous were the glowworms under the still trees and the fireflies that gleamed in the hot air. Lightning flashed fitfully from the darkening west, but as yet no thunder broke the heavy silence. The Cavaliere lighted another cigar, and pulled a cushion under his head, so that he could look down to the distant lights of the city. This is the story, he said. Once upon a time, late in the last century, the Duca di Castiglione was attached to the court of Charles the Third, King of the Two Sicilies, down at Palermo. They tell me he was very ambitious, and, not content with marrying his son to one of the ladies of the House of Tuscany, had betrothed his only daughter, Rosalia, to Prince Antonio, a cousin of the king. His whole life was wrapped up in the fame of his family, and he quite forgot all domestic affection in his madness for dynastic glory. His son was a worthy scion, 
cold and proud, but Rosalia was, according to legend, utterly the reverse, a passionate, beautiful girl, willful and headstrong, and careless of her family and of the world. The time had nearly come for her to marry Prince Antonio, a typical roué of the Spanish court, when, through the treachery of a servant, the duke discovered that his daughter was in love with a young military officer, whose name I don't remember, and that an elopement had been planned to take place the next night. The fury and dismay of the old autocrat passed belief. He saw in a flash the downfall of all his hopes of family aggrandizement through union with the royal house, and, knowing well the spirit of his daughter, despaired of ever bringing her to subjection. Nevertheless, he attacked her unmercifully, and by bullying and threats, by imprisonment, and even bodily chastisement, he tried to break her spirit and bend her to his indomitable will. Through his power at court, he had the lover sent away to the mainland, and for more than a year he held his daughter closely imprisoned in his palace on the Toledo, that one you may remember on the right, just beyond the Via de Collegio del Gesuiti, with the beautiful ironwork grills at all the windows and the painted frieze. But nothing could move her, nothing bend her stubborn will, and at last, furious at the girl he could not govern, Castiglione sent her to this convent, then one of the few houses of barefoot Camelite nuns in Italy. He stipulated that she should take the name of Madalena, that he should never hear of her again, and that she should be held an absolute prisoner in this conventual castle. Rosalia, or Sister Madalena, as she was now, believed her lover dead, for her father had given her good proofs of this, and she believed him. Nevertheless, she refused to marry another, and seized upon the convent life as a blessed relief from the tyranny of her maniacal father. She lived here for four or five years. Her name was forgotten at court, and in her father's palace. Rosalia di Castiglione was dead, and only Sister Madalena lived, a Carmelite nun in her place. In 1798, Ferdinand IV found himself driven from his throne on the mainland, his kingdom divided, and he himself forced to flee to Sicily. With him came the lover of the dead Rosalia, now high in military honor. He, on his part, had thought Rosalia dead, and it was only by accident that he found that she still lived, a Carmelite nun. Then began the second act of the romance, that until then had been only sadly commonplace, but now became dark and tragic. Michel, Michel Biscari, that was his name, I remember now, haunted the region of the convent, striving to communicate with Sister Madalena, and at last, from the cliffs over us, up there among the citrons, you will see by the next flash of lightning, he saw her in the great cloister, recognized her in her white habit, found her the same dark and splendid beauty of six years before, only made more beautiful by her white habit and her rigid life. By and by he found a day when she was alone, and tossed a ring to her as she stood in the midst of the cloister. She looked up, saw him, and from that moment lived only to love him in life, as she had loved his memory in the death she had thought had overtaken him. With the utmost craft they arranged their plans together. They could not speak, for a word would have aroused the other inmates of the convent. They could make signs only when Sister Madalena was alone. Michel could throw notes to her from the cliff, a feat demanding a strong arm, as you will see, if you measure the distance with your eye. And she could drop replies from the window over the cliff, which he picked up at the bottom. Finally he succeeded in casting into the cloister a coil of light rope. The girl fastened it to the bars of one of the windows, and, so great is the madness of love, Biscari actually climbed the rope from the valley to the window of the cell, a distance of almost two hundred feet, with but three little craggy resting places in all that height. For nearly a month these nocturnal visits were undiscovered, and Michel had almost completed his arrangements for carrying the girl from Santa Catarina and away to Spain, when unfortunately one of the sisters, suspecting some mystery from the changed face of Sister Madalena, began investigating, and at length discovered the rope neatly coiled up by the nun's window, and hidden under some clinging vines. She instantly told the Mother Superior, and together they watched from a window in the crypt of the chapel, the only place, as you will see to-morrow, from which one could see the window of Sister Madalena's cell. They saw the figure of Michel 
daringly ascending the slim rope, watched hour after hour, the sister remaining while the superior went to say the hours in the chapel, at each of which Sister Madalena was present. And at last, at prime, just as the sun was rising, they saw the figure slip down the rope, watched the rope drawn up and concealed, and knew that Sister Madalena was in their hands for vengeance and punishment, a criminal. The next day, by the order of the Mother Superior, Sister Madalena was imprisoned in one of the cells under the chapel, charged with her guilt, and commanded to make full and complete confession. But not a word would she say, although they offered her forgiveness if she would tell the name of her lover. At last the Superior told her that after this fashion they would act the coming night. She herself would be placed in the crypt, tied in front of the window, her mouth gagged, that the rope would be lowered, and the lover allowed to approach, even to the sill of her window. And at that moment the rope would be cut, and before her eyes her lover would be dashed to death on the ragged cliffs. The plan was feasible, and Sister Madalena knew that the mother was perfectly capable of carrying it out. Her stubborn spirit was broken, and in the only way possible she begged for mercy, for the sparing of her lover. The mother superior was deaf at first. At last she said, It is your life or his. I will spare him on condition that you sacrifice your own life. Sister Madalena accepted the terms joyfully, wrote a last farewell to Michel, fastened the note to the rope, and with her own hands cut the rope, and saw it fall, coiling down to the valley bed far below. Then she silently prepared for death, and at midnight, while her lover was wandering, mad with the horror of impotent fear, around the white walls of the convent, Sister Madalena, for the love of Michel, gave up her life. How? Was never known. That she was indeed dead was only a suspicion, for when Biscari finally compelled the civil authorities to enter the convent, claiming that murder had been done there, they found no sign. Sister Madalena had been sent to the parent house of the barefoot Carmelites at Avila in Spain, so the superior stated, because of her incorrigible contumacy. The old duke of Castiglione refused to stir hand or foot in the matter, and Michel, after fruitless attempts to prove the superior of Santa Catarina had caused the death, was forced to leave Sicily. He sought in Spain for very long, but no sign of the girl was to be found, and at last he died exhausted with suffering and sorrow. Even the name of Sister Madalena was forgotten, and it was not until the convents were suppressed and this house came into the hands of the Muxaros that her story was remembered. It was then that the ghost began to appear, and, an explanation being necessary, the story, or legend, was obtained from one of the nuns who still lived after the suppression. I think the fact, for it is a fact, of the ghost rather goes to prove that Michelle was right, and that poor Rosalia gave her life as a sacrifice for love. Whether in accordance with the terms of the legend or not, I cannot say. One or the other of you will probably see her to-night. You might ask her for the facts. Well, that is all the story of Sister Madalena, known in the world as Rosalia di Castiglione. Do you like it? It is admirable, said Rendell enthusiastically, but I fancy I should rather look on it simply as a story, and not much as a warning of what is going to happen. I don't much fancy real ghosts myself. But the poor sister is quite harmless, and Valguanara rose, stretching himself. My servants say she wants a mass said over her, or something of that kind, but I haven't much love for such priestly hocus-pocus. Oh, I beg your pardon turning to me. I had forgotten that you were a Catholic. Forgive my rudeness. My dear Cavaliere, I beg you not to apologize. I am sorry you cannot see things as I do. But don't for a moment think I am hypersensitive. I have an excuse. Perhaps you will say only an explanation. But I live where I see all the absurdities and corruptions of the Church. Perhaps you let the accidents blind you to the essentials. But do not let us quarrel to-night." See, the storm is close on us. Shall we go in? The stars were blotted out through nearly all the sky. Low, thunderous clouds, massed at the head of the valley, were sweeping over so close that they seemed to brush the black pines on the mountain above us. To the south and east, the storm clouds had shut down almost to the sea, 
leaving a space of black sky where the moon, in its last quarter, was rising just to the left of Monte Pellegrino, a black silhouette against the pallid moonlight. The rosy lightning flashed almost incessantly, and through the fitful darkness came the sound of bells across the valley, the rushing torrent below, and the dull roar of the approaching rain, with a deep organ point of solemn thunder through it all. We fled indoors from the coming tempest, and taking our candles said good night and sought each his respective room. My own was in the southern part of the old convent, giving on the terrace we had just quitted, and about over the main doorway. The rushing storm, as it swept down the valley with the swelling torrent beneath, was very fascinating, and after wrapping myself in a dressing gown, I stood for some time by the deeply embrasured window, watching the blazing lightning and the beating rain whirled by fitful gusts of wind around the spurs of the mountains. Gradually the violence of the shower seemed to decrease, and I threw myself down on my bed in the hot air, wondering if I really was to experience the ghostly visit the Cavalieri so confidently predicted. I had thought out the whole matter to my own satisfaction, and fancied I knew exactly what I should do in case Sister Madalena came to visit me. The story touched me. The thought of the poor faithful girl who sacrificed herself for her lover, himself very likely quite unworthy, and who now could never sleep for reason of her unquiet soul, sent out into the storm of eternity without spiritual aid or counsel. I could not sleep, for the still vivid lightning, the crowding thoughts of the dead nun, and the shivering anticipation of my possible visitation made slumber quite out of the question. No suspicion of sleepiness had visited me when, perhaps an hour after midnight, came a sudden, vivid flash of lightning, and, as my dazzled eyes began to regain the power of sight, I saw her, as plainly as in life, a tall figure shrouded in the white habit of the Carmelites, her head bent, her hands clasped before her. In another flash of lightning she slowly raised her head and looked at me long and earnestly. She was very beautiful, like the Virgin of Beltrafio in the National Gallery, more beautiful than I had supposed possible, her deep, passionate eyes very tender and pitiful in their pleading, beseeching glance. I hardly think I was frightened, or even startled, but lay looking steadily at her as she stood in the beating lightning. Then she breathed, rather than articulated, with a voice that almost brought tears, so infinitely sad and sorrowful was it. I cannot sleep. And the liquid eyes grew more pitiful and questioning, as bright tears fell from them down the pale, dark face. The figure began to move slowly towards the door, its eyes fixed on mine, with a look that was weary and almost agonized. I leaped from the bed and stood waiting. A look of utter gratitude swept over the face, and turning, the figure passed through the doorway. Out into the shadow of the corridor it moved, like a drift of pallid storm-cloud, and I followed, all natural, an instinctive fear or nervousness quite blotted out by the part I felt I was to play in giving rest to a tortured soul. The corridors were velvet-black, but the pale figure floated before me always, an unerring guide, now but a thin mist in the utter night, now white and clear in the bluish lightning through some window or doorway. Down the stairway, into the lower hall, across the refectory, where the great frescoed crucifixion flared into sudden clearness under the fitful lightning, out into the silent cloister. It was very dark. I stumbled along the heaving bricks, now guiding myself by a hand on the whitewashed wall, now by a touch on a column wet with the storm. From all the eaves the rain was dripping on to the pebbles at the foot of the arcade. A pigeon, startled from the capital where it was sleeping, beat its way into the cloister close. Still the white thing drifted before me to the farther side of the court, then along the cloister at right angles, and paused before one of the many doorways that led to the cells. A sudden blaze of fierce lightning, the last now of the fleeting trail of storm, leaped around us, and in the vivid light I saw the white face turned again with the look of overwhelming desire, of beseeching pathos, that had choked my throat with an involuntary sob when I first saw Sister Madalena. In the brief interval that ensued after the flash, and before the roaring thunder burst like the crash of battle over the trembling convent, I heard again the sorrowful words. I cannot sleep. 
come from the impenetrable darkness. And when the lightning came again, the white figure was gone. I wandered around the courtyard, searching in vain for Sister Madalena, even until the moonlight broke through the torn and sweeping fringes of the storm. I tried the door where the white figure vanished. It was locked. But I had found what I sought, and carefully noting its location went back to my room, but not to sleep. In the morning the Cavaliere asked Rendell and me which of us had seen the ghost, and I told him my story. Then I asked him to grant me permission to sift the thing to the bottom, and he courteously gave the whole matter into my charge, promising that he would consent to anything. I could hardly wait to finish breakfast, but no sooner was this done than, forgetting my morning pipe, I started with Rendell and the Cavaliere to investigate. "'I am sure there is nothing in that cell,' said Valguanera, when we came in front of the door I had marked. "'It is curious that you should have chosen the door of the very cell that tradition assigns to Sister Madalena. But I have often examined that room myself, and I am sure that there is no chance for anything to be concealed. In fact, I had the floor taken up once, soon after I came here, knowing the room was that of the mysterious sister, and thinking that there, if anywhere, the monastic crime would have taken place. Still, we will go in, if you like. He unlocked the door, and we entered, one of us, at all events, with a beating heart. The cell was very small, hardly eight feet square. There certainly seemed no opportunity for concealing a body in the tiny place, and although I sounded the floor and walls, all gave a solid, heavy answer, the unmistakable sound of masonry. For the innocence of the floor, the Cavaliere answered. He had, he said, had it all removed, even to the curving surfaces of the vault below. Yet somewhere in this room, the body of the murdered girl was concealed. Of this I was certain. But where? There seemed no answer, and I was compelled to give up the search for the moment, somewhat to the amusement of Val Guanera, who had watched curiously to see if I could solve the mystery. But I could not forget the subject, and towards noon started on another tour of investigation. I procured the keys from the Cavaliere, and examined the cells adjoining. They were apparently the same, each with its window opposite the door, and nothing— Stay! Were they the same? I hastened into the suspected cell. It was as I thought. This cell, being on the corner— could have had two windows, yet only one was visible, and that to the left at right angles with the doorway. Was it imagination? As I sounded the wall opposite the door, where the other window should be, I fancied that the sound was a trifle less solid and dull. I was becoming excited. I dashed back to the cell on the right, and, forcing open the little window, thrust my head out. It was found at last. In the smooth surface of the yellow wall was a rough space, following approximately the shape of the other cell windows, not plastered like the rest of the wall, but showing the shapes of bricks through its thick coatings of whitewash. I turned with a gasp of excitement and satisfaction. Yes, the embrasure of the wall was deep enough. What a wall it was, four feet at least, and the opening of the window reached to the floor, though the window itself was hardly three feet square. I felt absolutely certain that the secret was solved, and called the Cavaliere and Rendell too, excited to give them an explanation of my theories. They must have thought me mad when I suddenly began scraping away at the solid wall in front of the door, but in a few minutes they understood what I was about, for under the coatings of paint and plaster appeared the original bricks, and as my architectural knowledge had led me rightly, the space I had cleared was directly over a vertical joint between firm, workmanlike masonry on one hand, and rough, amateurish work on the other, bricks laid anyway, without order or science. Rendell seized a pick, and was about to assail the rude wall when I stopped him. "'Let us be careful,' I said. "'Who knows what we may find?' So we set to work, digging out the mortar around a brick at about the level of our eyes. How hard the mortar had become! But a brick yielded at last, and with trembling fingers I detached it. Darkness within. Yet beyond question there was a cavity there, not a solid wall, and with infinite care we removed another brick. Still the hole was too small to admit enough light from the dimly illuminated cell. With a chisel we pried at the sides of a large block of masonry, perhaps eight bricks in size. It moved, and we softly slid it from its bed. Valguanera, who was standing watching us as we lowered the bricks to the floor, gave a sudden cry, a cry like that of a frightened woman, terrible coming from him. Yet there was cause. 
framed by the ragged opening of the bricks, hardly seen in the dim light, was a face, an ivory image, more beautiful than any antique bust, but drawn and distorted by unspeakable agony. The lovely mouth, half open, as though gasping for breath, the eyes cast upward, and below, slim, chiseled hands crossed on the breast, but clutching the folds of the white Carmelite habit, torture and agony visible in every tense muscle, fighting against the determination of the rigid pose. We stood there breathless, staring at the pitiful sight, fascinated, bewitched. So, this was the secret. With fiendish ingenuity, the rigid ecclesiastics had blocked up the window, then forced the beautiful creature to stand in the alcove while, with remorseless hands and iron hearts, they had shut her into a living tomb. I had read of such things in romance, but to find the verity here before my eyes. Steps came down the cloister, and with a simultaneous thought we sprang to the door and closed it behind us. The room was sacred. That awful sight was not for curious eyes. The gardener was coming to ask some trivial question of Val Guanera. The cavalieri cut him short. Pietro, go down to Parco and ask Padre Stefano to come here at once. I thanked him with a glance. Stay, he turned to me. Signore, it is already two o'clock and too late for a mass, is it not? I nodded. Val Guanera thought for a moment, and then he said, Bring two horses. The Signore Americano will go with you. Do you understand? Then turning to me, You will go, will you not? I think you can explain matters to Padre Stefano better than I. Of course I will go, more than gladly. And so it happened that, after a hasty luncheon, I wound down the mountain to Parco, found Padre Stefano, explained my errand to him, found him intensely eager and sympathetic, and by five o'clock had him back at the convent with all that was necessary for the resting of the soul of the dead girl. In the warm twilight, with the last light of the sunset pouring into the little cell through the window where almost a century ago Rosalia had for the last time said farewell to her lover, we gathered together to speed her tortured soul on its journey, so long delayed. Nothing was omitted. All the needful offices of the church were said by Padre Stefano, while the light in the window died away, and the flickering flames of the candles, carried by two of the acolytes from San Francisco, threw fitful flashes of pallid light onto the dark recesses where the white face had prayed to heaven for a hundred years. Finally, the padre took the asperge from the hands of one of the acolytes, and with a sign of the cross in benediction, while he chanted the asperges, gently sprinkled the holy water on the upturned face. Instantly, the whole vision crumbled to dust. The face was gone, and where once the candlelight had flickered on the perfect semblance of the girl dead so very long, it now fell only on the rough bricks which closed the window, bricks laid with frozen hearts by pitiless hands. But our task was not done yet. It had been arranged that Padre Stefano should remain at the convent all night, and that as soon as midnight made it possible, he should say the first mass for the repose of the girl's soul. We sat on the terrace talking over the strange events of the last crowded hours, and I noted with satisfaction that the Cavalieri no longer spoke of the church with that hardness which had hurt me so often. It is true that the Padre was with us nearly all the time, but not only was Valguanera courteous, he was almost sympathetic, and I wondered if it might not prove that more than one soul benefited by the untoward events of the day. With the aid of the astonished and delighted servants, and with no little help as well from Signora Valguanera, I fitted up the long cold altar in the chapel, and by midnight we had the gloomy sanctuary beautiful with flowers and candles. It was a curiously solemn service. In the first hour of the new day, in the midst of blazing candles and the thick incense, the odor of the opening orange blossoms, drifting up in the fresh morning air, and mingling with the incense smoke and the perfume of flowers within. Many prayers were said that night for the soul of the dead girl, and I think many afterwards, for after the benediction I remained for a little time in my place, and when I rose from my knees and went toward the chapel door, I saw a figure kneeling still, and with a start recognized the form of the Cavalieri. I smiled, with quiet satisfaction and gratitude, and went away softly, content with the chain of events that now seemed finished. 
The next day the alcove was again walled up, for the precious dust could not be gathered together for transportation to consecrated ground. So I went down to the little cemetery at Parco for a basket of earth, which we cast in over the ashes of Sister Madalena. By and by, when Rendell and I went away, with great regret, Valguanera came down to Palermo with us, and the last act that we performed in Sicily was assisting him to order a tablet of marble, whereon was carved this simple inscription, Here lies the body of Rosalia di Castiglioni, called Sister Madalena. Her soul is with him who gave it. To this I added in thought, Let him that is without sin among you cast the first stone. End of Sister Madalena Recording by Gail Seymour Please visit my blog, The Voice of Gail, at gailseymour.blogspot.com G-A-I-L-S-E-Y-M-O-U-R dot B-L-O-G-S-P-O-T dot com.